for you, Dr. Stewart, give us your medical assessment of what happened on May 24th at Robb Elementary. Well, it was a horrific tragedy. Uh, and uh, there were many challenges of any active mass shooting event. The scenes, as, as I think you probably know as a journalist, are inherently chaotic. Uh, and having, there were, from a medical response, there was a challenge from a prolonged time from initial injury to initial treatment. For the, that's the, 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 from time of injury to initial treatment. Then there's, since it happened in a, in a, in a, from my standpoint, a, in a rural community, a really great rural community that is, uh, that's 80 to 85 miles away from definitive care. There's the time inherent from, from time to initial contact to time to transport to get patients to definitive care. And, uh, uh, there's the challenge, and I probably should have put this as the first. The greatest challenge is uh, caring for patients who have close range, high velocity gunshot wounds, typically multiple, multiple wounds with, uh, with horrific, devastating trauma. I mean, those are some of the initial challenges that, that, that the medical responders, the first responders and, and hospital teams face with those injuries. And then, uh, you know, the inherent chaos of, uh, of, of the scene itself create a lot of, a lot of challenges. And, uh, but my assessment based in, we've, we've done a preliminary assessment and my assessment uh, is that that Uvalde EMS and the, the EMS responders who responded across the entire region uh, responded effectively and did a very, very good job with respect to uh, care of those patients uh, admirably. I think they responded admirably. And, uh, and uh, what I know of the decisions that were made were, to me, reasonable good quality decisions. Uh, I think uh, taking patients directly from uh, the scene, from a, and, and, and I should probably, just bear with me for one second, I should probably qualify, because I don't want to do, I want to do the same things that I have concerns about the, I wasn't there, right, I wasn't at the scene, so just, so I want to say that um, uh, I wasn't there at the scene, but in, Retrospect, the decision to take patients from from the scene to the uh, high functioning level four trauma center at Uvalde Memorial is a to me is a is a solid decision. Even in retrospect, I have the ability to be sitting here with you in retrospect, and certainly at the at the at the scene, that's a decision that's made all the time in South Texas. Of do we go take the the longer transport to to San Antonio, or do we take a shorter transport and stabilize? And there's a lot of things that uh, that you can do in a in a level four trauma center to control bleeding, to uh, do airway management, to do to do initial stabilization while the patient's being uh, transferred to a level one trauma center, like University uh, Hospital or Brook Army Medical Center. And so I think those decisions were all uh, reasonable, good good quality decisions, I would say, what I know now. Do you think, with your experience, I know you've helped during Sutherland Springs as mm -hmm. well, and, and obviously you helped during uh, this response for patients that are transported out, outside of the active scene. You helped in the surgeries that followed. Do you think the outcome could have been different had those first responders gotten to the patients within a shorter period of time dealing with the injuries that they were dealing with? Well. I think I understand your question. I'm, I think from my standpoint, I would answer that time does matter. Time matters from time from injury to, to treatment. And so we, we strive to, to minimize that time to, to, like I said, there's physical limits in this setting to time to definitive care. 
uh, um, there's going to be a significant transport time, no matter no matter what decisions are made to get to. De- and by definitive care, I mean care in the in the level one urban trauma center, uh, university hospital, or Brook Army Medical Center, or or Methodist. Any. So, time does matter. Uh, and so there were delays. I mentioned what those delays: time from injury to initial medical treatment, from from the way from the way things unfolded at the scene. Uh, uh, and then there's there's an inherent uh, challenge of time based on how the distance from from Uvalde to San Antonio, the same in Southern Springs. There's just an inherent delay there. So time does matter. Unfortunately and sadly, tragically, time is not the only factor. Lethality of the mechanism matters a great deal. And so at close range, high velocity, AR-15 style, close range injuries, have a very high mortality rate, horrifically so, and that matters too. And so, uh, so the, the challenge with these mass shootings, with this, with this style of, of firearm, is that um, most, most of the patients who die are dead on the scene. And so, to me, and I've, I've talked about this, I feel like pretty extensively, um, y'all have done stories. The most important, most pressing issue for me is that we all commit to prevent this type of shooting from occurring. That's really what I think the public discussion should be about, is preventing this type of shooting from ever occurring in South Texas ever again. Because time does matter, but so does lethality of the mechanism. And uh, so I wasn't on the scene. I wasn't there. But but very capable, experienced EMS responders were. And uh, given the situation, I think they performed well, as I said, admirably. And, uh, and if, if I, don't live in, I don't live in Uvalde, but if I did live in Uvalde, if I did, I would feel comfortable and good about my EMS agency in Uvalde. There's always opportunities for improvement and we're looking for opportunities for improvement and we will find opportunities to improve. And uh, uh, when we do, we will bring those to the community and we're happy to talk about them with you or with anybody else with respect to things that we think are, can be improved. Uh, but once again, given the given the the horrific nature of the injuries and the situation that existed on the scene, with the with the delay from injury to initial contact with the patients, I, I think the medical response was was uh, very strong and and admirable. When we look at this shooting, we look at where it happened, like you said, in a rural community that is utilizing the resources as best that they can. Do you think had that shooting happened here, where we do have the close proximity to a level one trauma center, where we maybe have more EMS units able to respond, do you think the outcome could have been different? It's speculation, right, on my part. It is really speculation. So. So, so what I would say is that perhaps for, I'm just going to speculate, like what, per, perhaps for a few patients, if 
for the majority of patients. If, you, if you're shot at close range with a high velocity firearm that does massive tissue damage and you are right outside the operating room, I mean, I think your chances are better happening right outside the operating room, but there's also uh, the amount of damage that's done, particularly in vital areas of the body, like the head, neck, chest, abdomen, pelvis, it's unlikely to be saved even if you're right outside the operating room with those, with those, with that, that class of weapons. In this letter that was written by Strack today, this open letter talking about the response to the May 24th shooting and in response to this article that was put out, it adds a lot of the context to some of right. the facts that were put out into this into this article. Talk to me about what part of this context you think is most important for people to take away. Well, um, I think important context is that uh, important context is that there were many, many positive, uh, great things with respect to the response. Uh, we, the teams got whole blood to the scene in uh, a little over an hour, which is, uh, which is terrific. And, uh, and there were units there that were probably sooner with whole blood. Uh, and uh, the, the numbers of patients who were treated are so so small. I, 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 I'm, I've talked about patient privacy. So from my standpoint, I, I, I will say that, that we think that that whole blood made a difference in critically injured uh, patients who, were, who, who received that. Uh, there was a terrific mutual aid response from the, from the, from the uh, entire region surrounding Uvalde. There were what we refer to as air medical assets, helicopters, air medical helicopters. Uh, available who did transport patients. Uh, and it is, it is just so for context, it's very, very common in rural, uh, in rural scenes, in rural injuries, not just this, that, that, a, uh, that there will be a rendezvous point, a landing zone that has to be, you can't just land anywhere. And it's very common that there's a landing zone where, where ground EMS takes the patient initially and meets a helicopter. And that was done. That was done from the scene. Uh, and I mean, to be fair, people may quibble about where you do that, when you do it, and it's a matter of judgment. Uh, I've already said what I think. Even in retrospect, I think the decisions with respect to transporting to the local rural hospital were, were reasonable. And, um, and so I think that's important context to know that, that uh, it's 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 actually routine and normal to 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 take patients to a rendezvous point and meet. It's also, I think, for context, the there's an active active shooter with a law enforcement response at the scene, and uh, really, I, I, and I can I understand how some people might see. Well, you know, the helicopter should land right on the schoolyard but not with an active shooter where now you wind up with uh, you know, other injuries and potentially another crisis of if, if that helicopter is involved in that, in that scene. And then coordinating that, you know, is a, it's a, probably a matter of discussion. But uh, like I said, I believe, and I'm, I'm not a pre-hospital care person, I'm a hospital person, but I work, you know, I work with our pre-hospital colleagues all the time. I will say it is a very, very common thing that, uh, that ground EMS units transport a patient and meet with a helicopter uh, in a relatively close distance. And so I think that's context that, that matters. Uh, and again, I, I think that given the complexity and chaotic nature of all events like this, 
that I really, really hesitate to second guess decisions that, that a trained professional EMS responders make on the, on the scene who really have situational awareness about what's going on in the environment at that time if I wasn't there or if I didn't discuss with them what was the situation. It's a super complicated situation, tragic and, and horrible, but I think that's important context too. You guys have done, as STRAC, have done your preliminary assessment of what happened at May, on May 24th on the medical side of things. You're saying they had admirable response to the shooting. Are there any areas that you have seen where maybe we could have used improvement that day? We're, st we're not complete with our assessment, so I would like to complete it. I will say for... And, you know, you as a, a journalist, you, you cover a bunch of chaotic things. I think it's, it's, it's often that we find opportunities for improvement with respect, to, uh, with respect to how well we coordinate things, with respect to coordinating uh, the scene. Uh, we, we feel like whole blood uh, response was, whole blood was a, a strength, but... You know, we may find opportunities of where we could, we could get that there uh, faster, quicker. Our approach from the, from the medical side is to really look for opportunities to improve. It's very simple. We do our best, and we look back and say we can do it a little bit better. And that's, that's, what, that's what we're trying to do. And that's really what, you know, and I, I, I'm, I'm, I live in the city, Okay, I, I, I work at a level one trauma center and uh, I feel like that's actually what our rural and EMS providers are doing too though. Do their best and look back and see how they can do it a little bit better. And that's what we're trying to do. We haven't finished our assessment. So, so I don't want to comment on specific details, uh, but, but we, you know, Things that aren't uh, protected health information peer review, we will, you know, we, I think we've, we've tried and we, we try to do a good job of, of letting people know this is what, this is what we think we, we are going to improve and do better. I mean, I think the, 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 the cold stored O positive whole blood program, you know, that we had it already in existence before Southern Springs, but we realized that, that was, an opportunity for improvement. And I, I was skeptical that we could actually get whole blood to uh, it was a scene, but actually we've shown that we can, and we've shown that we can actually get it in rural areas and remote areas of the region. And so, so we came out of Southern Springs with that as a goal. We, we also came out that we needed to do stop the bleed education and training. And, you know, patients we received from, from Uvalde had... Uh, had those techniques applied, I think life-saving techniques. I think coming out of well, coming out of Southern Springs, you know, we had those things uh, that we we worked on, and I think those were better this time. Uh, but we, we probably we will have other opportunities to improve, and uh, I don't think there's any there's no. I don't hesitate to speak in over super 100%. I'm mean, no 100% of the time not, but I think with respect to mass casualty situations, I think we always find things that we could do better, that things that we can do better the next time. Stop the bleed. Uh, it was it was evident from patients we received that uh, there was bleeding control done. So from my point of view, that needs to balance. And it really is, I've said this before, to me and why I'm, I'm to some degree, I'm to some degree somewhat emotional about it. I believe that that response, that medical response in Uvalde of people responding, of, of, 
of responding to those patients under those circumstances is one of the most beautiful things that I know. It is really, to me, beautiful and best of all things for those who work for the relief and cure of suffering in that situation. And I, I think they performed admirably, honorably, and uh, effectively with skill. And uh, so, yeah, that's how I feel. And we're, we're, like I said, we use an approach. We're going to do our best, and we're going to look back and see how we can do it a little bit better. And we try to share those opportunities for improvement with ourselves and with the region and the world. And uh, that's what we're trying to do. And that's what that, I, I believe that's what that rural team is trying to do in, uh, in Uvalde as well, if I lived in Uvalde. I share the the sadness and the and the uh, anger as well with respect to uh, the entire situation. But from an EMS and from a hospital point of view, given the circumstances of that response, I would feel good about my EMS neighbors who responded and my rural hospital who did a really, really good job, I would feel good about that. And, uh, and I'm going to say from my point of view, from actually taking patients from, from there, the patients we received, uh, I think got fantastic care at, uh, through that, that, that EMS and hospital team in Uvalde. I know in this article, and this can be, I know you have uh, an appointment you have to get to, so this will be my last question for you. In that article, it pointed out three people who were pulled out of that room with critical injuries who later died, Jackie, Eva, and Xavier. But looking at the excellent care that you said the rural hospital gave and the EMS gave, do you think that they saved more people from being added to that total, that 21 total that were killed that day? I know they did. They, they did. For sure. I mean, it's, it's, I don't mean to laugh. It's, whenever I say I know, I, I, let's just put it like this, because I, I, I am emotional still. I've been emotional from the very first day, and I'm, I'm emotional still to this day. I said in one of the interviews, I haven't slept well since that day. So uh, I, should, I should probably qualify and say, I, rather than say I know, I feel extremely confident that yes, uh, that EMS and hospital team did save lives, did, Im- did improve the lives of the patients who were so severely injured, and really provided life-changing, life-saving care. And I, I think that team should feel good about that response. And there are, there are opportunities for improvement. Uh, I'm not saying I agree with the things that are, that, are, that are in that article with respect to some of the things that are in there. I, 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 I'm, I'm waiting for us to complete our assessment. I don't, I don't want to judge. I don't, I don't, I don't, want, to, I don't want to judge without, without us doing our full assessment. But uh, I've already said to, the, the lethality of the mechanism and, and from, a, from a purely from a, from a trauma standpoint, once someone has to have CPR at the scene from, from a high-velocity gunshot wound, the probability of survival is, um, is really, it's really very close to zero. And when you're 85 miles away, from definitive care, I mean, I, I feel horrible about it, but it is, it is a fatal injury at that time. That's why prevention, 
We should be talking about what can we do, and we should demand that we work together to reduce the probability of these injuries happening. And, and I've been very plain from the very beginning that I believe strongly that these incidents are largely preventable. It takes us working together across philosophic divides of working to do two things, work to understand and address the underlying root causes of violence while simultaneously working to make firearm ownership as safe as reasonably possible. And we've given a list of 14 to 18 things that we think would make a difference there. We've put together teams of, of very passionate but responsible firearm owners who have clear recommendations on what, what we could do uh, around firearm safety to, to, to reduce these things. We've put together teams of people who are injury prevention experts who, who have recommendations about what we could do to address the underlying root causes of violence that would actually reduce the frequency of these events. To me, that is the most important thing. And the reason why I say that is because is because once someone gains access to a classroom with a high with a high capacity magazine semi-automatic high velocity rifle AR15 styled firearm the lethality is horrific in that situation for the people who are in that classroom. So preventing it from occurring is the most important thing because you can't, we can't treat some of those, and we can't treat the majority of those, those types of injuries because they're, they're, they're rapidly and immediately fatal. Now there are some that are not, and that's why we that's why we, we we spend so much time with this with this thing we call the trauma system of how to get the how to minimize that time from injury to to initial care and minimize the time from initial care to to definitive care where someone's taken care of in a trauma center. But in this particular in this particular type of situation. Prevention is the most important thing. And we should all recognize it. And we should all acknowledge that it is preventable. It doesn't have to be this way. Thank you, Dr. Stewart. I appreciate it. Thanks. Keep up to date with all of San Antonio's top news, weather, and so much more by clicking the like and subscribe buttons below. And once again, thanks for watching KSAT.